Hey everybody, it's Benzie Mark and I am back with another video, but before we get started, I'd like to invite you guys to check out today's skirt of the day. If you have not had a chance to head over to themodestfitting.com, please do so so you can sign up for my newsletter and be notified when I drop my first collection of dresses and skirts featuring modesty, femininity, and beauty. But without further ado, let's get started in today's video. So I am back again with another video um, discussing some of the things that I'm reading in Fascinating Womanhood. Um, I said this disclaimer before, but I'm going to say it again. If you guys buy this book because you like the highlights that I am covering in my videos, please understand that not everything in this book is something that I stand behind and endorse. There have been quite a few things in here that I've read that have been very difficult for me to read and I just flat out disagree with them, but there's still a lot of gems in here that are worth discussing. I want to start off with a section that she has titled, Is It Fair? Frequently, women who are up to their necks in domestic work tied down to the 16-hour day routine of caring for children challenge this concept of roles. They claim this arrangement is unfair because women must work harder and longer hours than men. Therefore, they claim men don't have a right to come home and relax while the wife keeps on working. The men, they say, should help more with the housework, especially with the care of the children. This does seem fair on the surface, but there is another viewpoint. A woman's role, difficult as it is, lasts only about 20 years. Even if she has a large family, 20 years sees her through most of it. Then her life takes a turn. She has freedom and usually plenty of time, but the man's responsibility to provide the living lasts a lifetime. Even if he is fortunate enough to retire, he is never completely free from the feeling of responsibility to provide an income. Yes, when you see it this way, the division of work for the man and the woman is fair. I suggest you keep in mind the 20 year span. Do your work willingly and don't expect too much of your husband. Instead of complaining because he doesn't help you more, keep your marriage intact and cultivate romantic feelings. If you do, there are golden years ahead of you as in the following experiences. And then she includes some details from other people. I wanted to take time to point this out because this is a, a kind of gripe that, I, that I've heard from quite a few women and even myself, I feel it sometimes. Um, it's exactly as she says, where like the husband will come home from a long day of work and he'll kind of just plop down on the couch and prop up his feet and he'll kind of, in the from the wife's perspective, just watch her vacuum the floor while he's relaxing or watch her try to deal with the kids while she's cooking. And I do think that if a man is uh, willing to help in those situations, that's a good thing. But I do think it's a difference between just kind of cheerfully accepting help from your husband where he is able to render it versus um, this kind of like, expecting that he's going to shoulder the burden of household work with you after he has come home from from his own job because i think that when we have that expectation and it goes unmet we can become upset and in the long term bitter about how we feel like this uh divide of work is unfair but what i'm i actually agree with her and i'm really thankful that she Put this perspective in because and this I think applies more if you are a homemaker housewife um, it's a little bit different if you're a full-time working woman so I'm speaking to homemakers and housewives when I say this that notion of like you have pretty much 20 years of work that's that's a very real thing and that's something that because I um, live in an environment and among social groups where housewives and homemakers are the norm i see women who are at home and they're in different uh, stages i've seen some women who have just had the first child or they don't have any children yet and i've also seen on the other end where the woman has already had her children and slowly one by one they're starting to leave the nest and so she has less and less work to do this is a very real thing this is a very real thing and it helped me to not have a kind of like a complaining uh, spirit when I would be like, I'm doing all this and my husband isn't helping. But that's a very short-sighted and narrow view. When you, when you spread it out and you look across the entire marriage, the wife really does have about 20 years of go time, but the rest of that time, she is free to do what she wants to do with that time. She doesn't have to shoulder the responsibility of, of providing for the family. That's a responsibility that never leaves the husband. 
I had my grandfather who wasn't a very well-to-do man and so he worked up until pretty much like his last decade of life and that responsibility to work to provide never left him it never left him whereas my grandmother was a homemaker and a housewife and she did a lot of the she did the lion's share of the housework of the child rearing but once her children were grown she spent most of her time um she would sit out on her porch. She would uh, tend to her garden where she was growing fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, she would go visit with the neighbors, bring them baked goods, received baked goods from them. She had a very, I don't want to say an easy life, but it was a much less stressful life on the tail end while my grandfather kind of had that ongoing stress and strain for the duration of his working life and even into his old age. And so that's a very real thing. Another example, I had a friend of mine who has four children and she just saw her last child off into elementary school and she was just coming and coming to church and asking for prayer about like hey like can i want to get prayer because i just want god to like kind of direct me and tell me how i'm to spend my time and what i was realizing she was saying is like she's been mothering for almost 18 years now and now that her last child is in school she has pretty much a full schedule to do with what she wants. And she's like, I have so much time, I don't even know what to do with it. And I'm like, this is perfect. This is the time for you to take that much needed rest that you probably didn't get for the past 18 years. This is a time for you to invest in whatever hobbies you might have. If you've always wanted to start a garden, now is the time to do it. If you wanted to learn how to sew, now is the time to do it. If you wanted to hone your baking skills and start making your own bread and start making all of your own baked goods, now is the time to do it. This is also an opportunity to be of service to the people around you. You can literally look for other women in your church who um, have need and you can fill in and you're free to do that and you're free to do it with a cheerful and happy spirit because you're not drained and stressed out from a full day's work or a 40 50 60 hour work week like these are some of the unspoken blessings on the tail end when you have made your home your priority and when you've taken on the burden of uh, the lion's share of the burden of child rearing and housework there is a there is a kind of a beautiful place just just beyond the river bend, if you will, where it's a place of rest and freedom for the woman and she can kind of build, uh, manage her time how she wants. She could, you could spend that time getting in shape. If you know you want to shave off some, some pounds and slender down, you have the time and space and energy to do that. These are some of the hidden blessings, I think, for, for women who have made homemaking their primary vocation. But let's keep going to see what else she has to say. Um, this is um, advice for how women can be better followers to their husband. And there's a long list here, but I'm going to focus specifically on number four. She says, be adaptable. Don't be rigid and set in your ways. Adjust to life's circumstances. Follow your husband where he wants to go and adapt to the conditions he provides for you. Every woman who is an ideal wife and makes a man happy has this quality. Rare in women, it is treasured by men. To be adaptable, you have to be unselfish, care more about him than yourself, and put your marriage in priority above all else. But when you cast your bread upon waters, it comes back buttered. To be adaptable, you can't be inflexible. You can't have preconceived ideas about what you want out of life, such as where you want to live, the kind of house, lifestyle, economic level, or plans for, the, for your children. It's all right to have preconceived ideas as long as they are not inflexible. Rigid ideas may clash with your husband's plans, plans he must carry out to succeed in his masculine role. Now, that is probably a really hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. Um, and I'm up to hear your, your feedback on if you agree or disagree with her. But again, um, having been married um, for a while now, I, I tend to agree with her on this um, characteristic of being adaptable. I, I went through my own period of time where um, I, it was like we were several years into the marriage. We had one child at the time. And I just realized that my life had, while my life was very good, my life had turned out very differently than what I had planned for myself. And there was a kind of a period of kind of mourning the loss of my personal plans. Um, and, uh, and I remember the way I explained it to someone, it was like, if you go to a restaurant and you order a lobster, and instead of lobster, they bring you out filet mignon, if you're disappointed, is it really because the filet mignon is not good enough? 
No, filet mignon is excellent. But when you've got your mindset on lobster, it can be kind of disappointing. And that's a little bit how I felt about my life. I had a very, very good life, but it was also very, very different than what I had envisioned for myself. And I did have that period where I just kind of was sad. And I realized it's because I had very rigid and fixed ideas about what I was going to do with my future. And I really didn't take into consideration a husband or children into that. And I did eventually have someone counsel me and they said, you know, Joyce, like there is room to kind of feel sad for kind of the things that you wanted that you may not be able to do at least now or you may not be able to do ever. And there is a a space and a time to feel sad about it. But at what point do you just receive the Lord's sovereignty over your life? And that was a really good question. Because when I say that I had felt sad about it, there was, that was like a good six, seven, eight months. I feel like it was almost like a, a bit of a, a quarter life crisis, um, if such a thing even exists. I really did have a moment where I was I felt disillusioned with life, but I realized in hindsight, it was because I had very fixed and rigid ideas, and it was actually once I decided to, unknowing, unbeknownst to me that this book taught about this, but once I decided to embrace adaptability and kind of be be able to to bend and move with my husband as we navigate life together as opposed to trying to spearhead my own life by myself that's when i started to feel better about life in general but i wanted to include this because how many of us have it in our minds about what kind of house we want what lifestyle we want what economic level we want to be at what kind of plans we have for our children. Oftentimes we can be really bullheaded as women about what we want and how we want it and when we want it. But I don't know that that insisting in our own way, insisting on our own way is compatible with biblical standards. And it's certainly not compatible with the position of a Christian wife. A Christian wife yields to her husband's leadership, obeys him and respects his, his, uh, his leading. And so when we are um, insistent that we have a certain house that has these features and and this and that, it's one thing to ask your husband, that's totally fine. But if you're going to like throw a fit that you don't have a a house with a white picket fence and a big, and a big uh, lawn and all of these things, like that's a kind of rigidity that can steal joy from you and it sours the marriage and thereby stealing joy from your husband too. Um, like, I think lifestyle and economic level is another one of those things that we can be kind of, um, bullheaded about. Now, I don't want to, um, don't, don't get it twisted. I, I believe that every man has a responsibility to provide food, shelter, clothing, and medical care. But once he has done that, I think that it's on the wife's part. It's the wife's responsibility to graciously receive what her husband has provided, regardless of what tax bracket he is in regardless of what luxuries you may or may not have. And I think that that's the hard part for a lot of women. A lot of women hold their husband's provision in contempt because it's not what they wanted, even though he is actually seeing to his responsibilities and duties. And I think that that's wrong. I think it's sin. And I also think it hinders um, a, a woman's ability to enjoy her marriage. Now, again, I'm not talking about going hungry. Like if, if y'all are not eating food, that's something that needs to be discussed. But if he's providing food, shelter, appropriate clothing for the c- climate that you guys live in, and you have access to medical care, he's doing his job as a man. And it's on us as women, as, the, as a wife, to accept that with graciousness. This next section is called, Why is Chivalry Dead? If men have an inborn sense of chivalry, why don't they offer it? The answer is very simple. Men don't offer their chivalry because women have become capable. They no longer appear to need men. Men only need men only feel a sense of duty to protect women who need their masculine care and protection or at least appear to need it. When a woman can do a job as well as a man, why should he offer his masculine assistance? How would he how he would feel humiliated to offer his assistance when it would be rejected. Now, again, this is probably, uh, ooh, this is speaking to our, our feminist little hearts. Um, I, uh, I remember a female relative of mine on my husband's side, so my in-laws. Um, there was a woman who was trying to carry something heavy 
and uh, she, we were like in a storage unit and was trying to take this heavy thing down and there was a man nearby that saw her like trying to do this and he offered to help and she said no 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 I got it I got it I work out I can do this and I just remember thinking to myself man this is this is what this is what this segment is talking about and then before I give my other two cents I I um I watched this other um, video actually by life coach Sean. I love her video. She used to go by the name Bronze Goddess, but now she's changed her name. And she made a video just discussing the notion as women have become more independent, have we seen men become more dependent? Um, and it was discussing about how like um, there are men who expect for women to pick them up when they go on dates, men who expect women to pay when they go on dates. That's a bit outside of the point. But, but what I'm trying to demonstrate is that there's actually, um, for at least when it comes to relationships between men and women, there's actually a bit of advantage in being the one who has need. There's actually advantage in being the one who has a vulnerability because when it comes to relationships between men and women, generally speaking, men have this innate design to protect and provide women and children and they actually relish the opportunity to be of service. And so when we as women say, I don't need you, I can do it myself, it actually dampens that desire they have to serve us. And we see that even with chivalry. There was a time when a woman wouldn't dare open a door on her own. And that's why, because a woman wouldn't do it, a man was like, oh, I gotta do it. And it was without even thinking they would do it. There was also a time where a woman would get on some public transport. If there were no seats available, multiple men would get up to, to give their seat. But now, because women are so, I can do it, I don't need you, I don't need your your help, they, they, just, they just stopped doing it. They just stopped doing it. And then going back to the dating thing, because women are so like, I'm independent, I got my own money, I don't, and then, well, the men are like, well, if you, don't, if you don't need my money, then I guess we'll use your money. And then now it's just complete role reversal. And so I thought this was interesting to include because um, I have learned as I've gotten older that even if I can do something on my own, I oftentimes choose not to. And I allow the men around me to help me. First and foremost, my husband, I, I could go out and work. I let my husband do that for me. And it's his pleasure to provide for our family. It's his pleasure to be the one who is the one who dispenses the resources to us that we need. That makes him feel like a man. If I'm out in public and I have to lift something heavy, um, as soon as someone sees me struggling, they say, ma'am, can I help you with that? I say, yes, sir. Yes, you can. I don't, I don't, um, I don't block men from being chivalrous and extending to me um, aid and help because I'm a woman and that's what they should do. But unfortunately, because we have taught women to try to make themselves on par with men and even equal to men, which is delusional, we are not identical to men, we have kind of alienated ourselves from their help and resources and service. And something that I've chosen to do is I've intentionally, no, 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 I can do many things, but I choose to let them do it for me. I choose to let them do it for me. I don't, why am I going to be lifting heavy boxes if there's a bunch of able-bodied men around me? They can do it, and it's their joy to do it. I move out of the way and let them do it. And I think that that's a, a good way to think about chivalry. The next time someone offers to open the door for you, let them. The next time you're in the grocery store and you're grabbing for a produce uh, bag and it's kind of high out of your reach and a man offers to get it, let him get it for you and say thank you, thank you, sir, when he gives it to you. Men will start being more chivalrous when one, we, we receive their chivalry graciously and then two, when we require it. And I don't mean require it like screaming at him like you need to do this. It's just maybe you just stand at the door and wait for him to open it. He'll get it. He'll get it eventually. And when he does, you make sure and you say thank you. Okay, so the next thing she has in here is, this is chapter 10 called The Provider. And under the title, it says, A man needs to function, feel needed, and excel women as a provider. I know in just that sentence alone, that's probably offended a lot of people, but um, just, continue, just continue listening if you can. Um, I wrote as my own note, just having read the section, I wrote this in and I said, 
A man not allowed to function is an unhappy man and will make those around him unhappy too. Later on down the page, she says, another reason the man should provide. Inborn in a man is a keen sense of responsibility to provide the living and to function effectively in this role. Being successful in this area of his life is as important to his feeling of worth as a woman's in succeeding as a mother and a homemaker. Now, this may not necessarily land the way that it's intended to if you are a woman who doesn't necessarily value motherhood or if you don't value um, effective homemaking. But as someone who has made it my primary vocation to be a homemaker, a housewife, I deeply value those things. I want to be an effective mother. I want to be an effective homemaker. I want my home to be a place that when I invite guests, they feel comfortable here because they know it's clean, it's cozy, they have good, there's good smells in here, good smells of bread and tea and coffee and um, that kind of stuff I value. So when I understand how I value that, I understand more fully how my husband feels validated and um, confident when he is allowed and given space and freedom and room to operate as the provider, the dispenser of the family's resources. It really does something to him to make him feel good inside and it, it even um, incentivizes him to keep doing it and to keep doing more of it. Um, that's a real that's a really true thing. And and I see here with my with my little note, a man not allowed to function is an unhappy man and will make those around him unhappy too. That I think is true as well. I think that that's true when when a wife is um, dealing with a husband who's grumpy or just generally speaking kind of like ill-tempered, bad mood, and it's a constant thing. It's not just every now and then. It could be that there's some aspect, there's some avenue of his manhood that's being blocked and he can't express himself and it's depriving him of a sense of accomplishment and joy and it's uh, surfacing as grumpiness and quick tempered and just irritability. So just bear that in mind as we're reading through these things, what things might be blocking my husband's ability to function fully as a man and specifically as a provider. Um, and so then later in, in the section, in this chapter, it says, although a man has a sacred and binding obligation to provide the necessities, he is under no such obligation to provide luxuries. We kind of touched on this a little bit more, but let's keep reading. Women and children are not entitled to ease and luxury, to style and elegance. His duty is not to provide a costly home, expensive furniture, and decor. Concerning the education of his children, he has an obligation to provide a basic education, but such a binding obligation does not extend to higher education, music lessons, the arts, and cultures. He may, he may wish to provide these things, and it may bring him much pleasure to do so, but it is not mandatory. Again, I think this just comes from having a level-headed understanding of what your husband's responsibilities to you and to your children actually are. I think I, I would like to believe that most women are reasonable and they understand that a man, his, his job is, again, food, shelter, clothing, medical care. He must do those things. And everything else beyond that is just extra. It's just icing on the cake, but it's not mandatory. And I would like to think that most women are reasonable enough to be able to make those distinctions. But I feel like because she had to write it in, and I've also listened to some of my friends complain about not having some of the finer things in life, I feel like it is something that we sometimes have to be um, reminded of. And I think that the antidote to entitlement is gratitude. Instead of focusing on all the things you don't have that you feel like you should have, instead redirect your focus to all the things you already have and thank God for them. Because um, while it is very cliche, I think it is a, a true thing that there are a lot of people who the very circumstances that you are complaining about, there are people who would give anything to trade places with you. There are many people who would give anything to have a husband. There are people who would give anything to have a husband who provides for them. You know, there's, there's people would give anything to have a husband, a husband who provides and a husband who is faithful. Like there are so many things that we can be grateful for. And, and this speaks to me a little bit as well. I have to pray every morning, God, give me an attitude of gratefulness um, towards my husband and what he provides for me and take away from me a spirit of criticism and complaint. I have to pray that over myself. And I would say if you, if you know, if you can say honestly, that that's something that you struggle with, start praying with that. Because 
it it only causes negative things to to sprout up in the marriage it um complaining um feeling like you deserve what you don't have all of the things like nothing good ever comes from that it's, and especially if your husband is actually seeing to his duties and responsibilities now if he's not working if he's gambling all the, the family's money away that's something entirely different but if he's doing what he's supposed to do you guys have food you have a roof over your head you can go to the doctor when you need to you have clothes if you live in a cold climate you've got your your thick jackets and uh, closed toed boots to keep you warm and healthy he's doing his job and you should thank him for that we should thank our husbands instead of focusing on what we don't have we should be so grateful for all that he has already done for us and really ultimately what the lord has done for us through our husbands i'm going to keep reading on this is more about um how a husband is a provider and kind of what his experience is like with that it says the majority of men when they come of age and marry take on an enormous burden which they may not lay down with any conscience this side of the grave quietly Without histrionics, they put aside, in the name of love, most of their vaunted freedom and contract to take upon their shoulders full social and economic responsibility for their wives and their children. As a woman, consider for a moment how you would feel if your child should be deprived of the good things of life, proper housing, clothing, education. Consider how you would feel if he should go hungry. Perhaps such ideas have occurred to you and have given you a bad turn momentarily but they are passing thoughts a woman does not give them much credence they are not her direct responsibility certainly she does not worry about them for long but such thoughts conscious or unconscious are her husband's daily fare he knows and he takes the carking thought to work with him each and every morning and to bed with him each and every night that upon the success or failure of his efforts rests the happiness, health, indeed the very lives of his wife and children. In the ultimate, he senses he alone must take full responsibility for them. Does that not sound like crushing weight? Does that not sound like crushing weight? And again, this is where I'm like, we as wives do well to better understand the plights of our husbands because I think when we better understand when we have knowledge it's easier to do our part of obedience the bible tells women to respect and obey their husbands and part of what makes that easier is when we take a time to consider dang i don't really worry about if what my kids are going to have to eat tonight i don't worry about if my pantry is going to run out and then i have to just tell my children sorry there's no food today maybe we'll try again tomorrow like these are thoughts that most wives most don't have to worry about i certainly don't worry about them but as i've been married longer and i've gotten older and my ch and i've had more time raising my children i realize my husband just like this book says wakes up and goes to bed every night re realizing and it's always present on his mind i am responsible for the feeding the nurturing the care and provision of four people these four people himself me and our children they won't eat if i don't work they will go without if i don't exert the energy and i just realized i'm so blessed that i don't even think about that and most wives are blessed that we don't think about that we're busy keeping the house clean keeping it tidy wiping runny noses chasing behind children and that is real work and that is hard work but because that is our focus we don't ever have to think about where is the next uh resource coming from we just manage the resources we never give thought to uh getting the resources does that make sense and so let's honor our husbands let's appreciate them Let's be a little softer when he leaves those socks on the floor. Let's leave, let's be a little softer when he doesn't take the trash out as frequently as he should. Because man, he's carrying a heavy burden. He really is. That's another reason why this is an aside. But for women who desire more children, I think it's perfectly fine to talk to your husband and voice your desire for more children. But please don't press him. Please don't get upset if he says no. Because ultimately, when a woman is demanding that her husband give her more children, what she's saying is, yep, I'm on your back and our existing kids are on your back and I want to pile more on and you better be happy about it. That is not fair. 
consider the load that your husband is carrying. You are you are on his back. And it's a load that he willingly took on because he did choose you as his bride. But you're a load nonetheless. You bring great uh, value to him, but you are a burden. I am a burden. My husband has to feed me and clothe me and house me and provide me with ongoing resources so that I can maintain our home. I am a burden to him, but I do take the resources that he gives to me and then gives them back, give them back to him, right? In the form of a clean home, meals, someone who can listen to him because I'm not stressed out about my day, so I'm available to listen to him about his stressful day. But we, we are, we are a, a weight and a load to be carried, wives and our children. So when your husband says, hey, this is as many kids as I can have, don't press him. Don't push him because you're you're saying put more bricks on your back and be happy about it. That's not right. Later on in the section, she goes over how can we help? Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I did think it was worth an honorable mention. And so I'm going to go through them quickly. If you're a wife who has become aware of the burden that your husband carries and providing for you and providing for your children, these are some practical things that you can do to literally help him um, to provide some reprieve, um, make his burden lighter. Number one, reduce expenses, um, budget with your husband um, and, and honor the budget. And even once you have the budget, save where you can. Um, number two, reduce demands on his time. This is a hard one. This was a hard one even for me. Uh, if your husband works long hours or gives himself devotedly to his work, when he comes home, he needs time to relax and recover. You may have to forego places you want to go or things you planned for him to do and adjust your life to his. That's a hard pill to swallow when we're very uh, self first. If our first and foremost priority is ourself, this is going to be really hard to do. Um, this might mean that you have something that's broken in the house and you're just waiting for your husband to get home and so that you can tell him and he can fix it. But to think of him first would be to give him some time to relax, to give him some time to unwind. And depending on how much time he needs, you may just have to wait until maybe the next day, two days later, to take that request to him if he, if he is visibly um, just exhausted and spent. Number three, live your feminine role. Instead of helping your husband provide the income, provide a wonderful home life. Let him make the living and you can make the life worth living. Keep the home intact so it is running smoothly with all daily needs met. Be feminine, be cheerful, and do all you can to bring a peaceful spirit to the home. Such an atmosphere will relieve his anxieties and help him succeed as a provider. This is very true. I think our first thought when people say, even people who criticize the housewife or criticize the homemaker, they will say, why don't you help your husband? Why don't you go out and get a job and help your husband? Actually, um, your husband very likely doesn't need your help in earning an income. He needs your help to create an environment that gives him reprieve from the difficulties of life. That's how he needs your help. He needs your help to hold back complaints and criticisms when he gets home. He needs you to hold back the children fighting and bickering right in his ear as soon as he gets off on a day, a, a hard day of work. He needs you to perhaps have a, a, a warm meal ready to go um, that you can sit down peacefully together and enjoy and re-nourish himself. Those are the ways that we help our husbands. There, I think perhaps we don't consider them first because we even we ourselves maybe don't um, properly value what home can really offer a man, but we are the keepers of the home. We are the makers of the home. So make your home to serve your husband. When he comes home, let this be his favorite place to be. He loves to relax. He has freedom and space and quiet and calm here. That's how you help your husband. Um, later on, this is the last point that I'll cover. It covers his drive for status. Parallel to his pressing responsibility to provide the living is his drive for status. This again, we need to understand with an all comprehending, excuse me, all comprehending sympathy. The driving desire for status is noticeable in all male members of the animal kingdom. Robert Audrey in his book African Genesis states that in the animal world, the instinct for status for the acquisition and defense of territory is more compelling for the male than is the sex instinct. The pecking order in the barnyard, the formation in which a flock of wild geese fly, the hierarchy in a colony of baboons, and the ranking within a herd of elephants is more driving for is a more driving force 
for the male than it then is the sex function this drive for position is evident in the human male as he pushes for a higher rank in his work don't think his sole motivation is money although money is usually the main incentive the desire for position is also a factor this is evident in the man who doesn't need more money but drives on for a higher level of achievement I think the reason why she's including this in here is to give us insight that when we fight against our husband's ambitions, we are actually fighting against a key component of his masculinity, of his God-given masculinity that God put into him. And he is when he is striving, when he is a trying to achieve more, when he has that drive, he's actually functioning properly as a man. And I think she put it in here so that we as women can understand that so we do not get in the way and hinder our men from being men. And this is something that um, I have to learn from as well. Um, even, and it doesn't even necessarily be at work. It could even be at church. Your husband may be being... Um, honored and um not promoted but kind of like exalted as a as a trusted leader in the community which may make more demands on his time and a wise wife is not going to get in the way and stand in the way of that happening and taking place the wise wife is going to understand okay he's got obligations there and i might need to pick up some slack here to support that advancement because my husband advancing is my husband being a man there's actually something really broken and wrong with a man who has no desire to achieve, who has no desire to advance, which brings its own kind of pain and suffering. Because there, are, I know women who are married to men like that, and it's super frustrating for them. They, they hate the fact that their husband just doesn't seem to have the zest for life. But then the opposite, which is the man who does have the drive, who does have the ambition, who does have that masculine desire for advancement, we also complain about that. And at some point, we as wives are just going to have to stop complaining. And we definitely need to stop complaining about the things that are innately masculine to our men. We have to stop complaining about our men being men. Because then what? What do we want them to become? Like women? Oh no, we definitely don't want that. That's how we end up with men saying, come pick me up at eight and you got the tab. We don't want that. I don't want that. So let's celebrate our men being men and put our big girl panties on, if you will, and assume our position. And to do so from a place of emotional steadiness as opposed to emotional neediness. Because while our husbands can meet some of our emotional needs, the person that we're to turn to to meet all of our needs is our father. So when we start placing demands on our husbands that are ultimately designed for our fathers, we're going to find that we are inhibiting our husbands. But as always, thank you guys for tuning in. Please leave your thoughts, your feedback, and your comments in the comment section below. As always, thank you for tuning in, and I will see you next time.